it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody today um, to this talk by uh, who's going to be led by Rav and Anjani, um, which is on the Punjab and partition stories told through the streets of London. Um, and it's a collaboration between the Little History of Sikhs and the MMPI project, uh, Migrant Memory and the Post-Colonial Imagination Project, which is run at Loughborough University. So it's a five-year project which has been funded by the Lee Hume Trust and it started in 2017, which was the 70th anniversary of the 1947 partition um, of British India. And the project explores the memories of that partition and how they circulate in and through South Asian communities in the UK, particularly in Loughborough in the East Midlands and in London and particularly East London. So the project explores memories of decolonization, particularly in relation to partition and independence and the processes of migration which followed on from that. We're interested in how those memories are communicated and how they circulate in different British Asian communities. So we're particularly concerned with how social practices and processes of remembering decolonization inform a sense of um, community identity and identities between communities as well, and how this shapes people's sense of belonging in the UK and how it um, develops a sense of national identity, which is, might relate to Britishness, but also other national identities as well. Um, I'm delighted to be able to say the session is going to be led by Rav Singh and Anthony Dillon, um, who are both uh, from the Little History of the Sikhs. So Anthony is one of our students at Loughborough University. She studies sociology and she's from West London. And Rav is the founder of the Little History of the Sikhs, uh, which deliver a huge range of lectures and tours on Sikh history. So I just want to say then a little bit about the partners that we work with and the partnerships that, that kind of structure the, the Migrant Memory and Post-Colonial Imagination Project. So the approach that we use is kind of a, a mixed methods approach. We use archival research, we use sort of classic ethnographic methods, um, sort of in-depth interviewing and observation, as well as participatory arts and creative activities. And it's these activities that we use to encourage um, people that participate in the project to engage with the research themes. So um, how memories are communicated um, over time and space and between communities. And we've used things like cooking, textiles projects, so looking at fabrics and inherited clothes, uh, photography, film, music, all of these kinds of things. We've had activities based, based, based on these. And the interesting thing about using kind of cultural activities as a way into people's memories and the ways memories circulate is they provide alternative ways for us um, to talk about remembering. It's very different talking about the memory of a taste from the memory of a sound, from the memory of um, the, the texture of a fabric. So it helps us get a sense of how memory works and how memories become meaningful to us as part of our everyday lives and as part of our own sense of identity. And this is a reason why we've teamed up with A Little History of the Sikhs, apart from just being generally wonderful. Uh, the tours um, of London uncover the legacy of empire um, in contemporary Britain, and they offer rooms to reflect on the impact of colonialism uh, by thinking about how we move around the space, uh, around us, spaces that we might be quite familiar with already, uh, but that hold these kind of hidden histories. Um, and it tells us a lot about how partition and migration had an impact or, or, or related to the lives of British Sikh people. So I'm going to hand back over to Rav. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have more participants joining us, which is great. And we will start with this slide. So as Emily said, I'm Rav Singh, um, founder of A Little History of the Sikhs. Today, I'm going to be joined by Julie Dillon. She's from Loughborough University. And between us, we're going to take you through some sites in London and explore some partition stories. So I've recognised a few names on the uh, meeting, and that's great. Um, because these people have actually been on the tours and like Emily said what I try and do is take you to spaces that are not generally connected with Sikhi, Punjab, India uh, but when we go into those spaces we can uncover items, stories, bring them out like I'm trying to show on these pictures and the underlying theme is really for a little history that the past is always alive if it is remembered and for our younger generation, this knowledge of our past, I believe, definitely has power 
um, and it can, and if we save it from human forgetfulness, it can help individuals develop um, their careers in Britain, um, in their working lives, in their spiritual lives. And I, that's, that's the whole aim of um, A Little History of the Sikhs, to be honest. Um, if they can find out about themselves, take an interest in that, um, show it through the city they live in, um, because London has so much, explore and hopefully make them a bit more confident about being British Sikhs or Sikhs in Britain, um, etc. And that's what we like to do. So what we're going to do, um, for those of you who are new to A Little History of the Sikhs, is the way we do this is we run a range of tours in London. I think I'm up to about 15 different tours and we look at different themes. They could be um, Sikh and Punjabi women in London. It could be the Sikh wars, the Anglo-Sikh wars in London, generals of the East India Company, Second World War stories, Seek art or treasures and we just tailor these tours and we go to different places and we try to walk um, and we try and walk because London allows us to do that um, and it's quite amazing how much you can uncover. So our series here, five lectures, um, sorry five tours, two virtual, then we will go out on the streets. The weather's quite good today so I'm pleased some of you have joined us uh, because it's kind of sitting out weather, good walking weather, but we will start those in July, so July, August, and September. Okay, so shall we start? Um, tour one, Punjab and partition. So for those who have seen my slides before, this is my general Punjab and London slide. This is how I connect Punjab and London. So this is a governance map of London. It shows the historic city of London in the center, and that's all it is the one mile square mile. It's surrounded by these 32 boroughs, I think each of which does have a Sikh community and each of which probably has a larger Punjabi community. Um, and these streets of London, they have a wealth of history, buildings, museums, artifacts, objects, galleries and events. And all of these little treasures can uncover a wealth of stories. And today those stories are going to connect to Punjab and partition events, both pre and post partition in 47. So for those of you who are from a Sikh background or a Punjabi background, this is the London Borough of Ealing, within which um, you have the town of South Hall. And this is where my co-host today, <coughs> Ajuni is joining us from. So she's from West London in South Hall, quite close to Heathrow Airport. And I myself am in the London Borough of Redbridge. And it's interesting because both these boroughs, Ealing and Redbridge have um, are marketed as Punjab. Um, Little Punjab is South Hall and Little Lahore um, is Redbridge. And if anyone, if anyone comes to Ilford and you know Ilford Lane, that's kind of marketed as Little Lahore and um, more famous is probably um, South Hall, which is Little Punjab in Ely. But our tour today, we're going to take you through these places. So I've selected a few new ones. Um, based on our themes, and we're going to start at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Then we will move to the National Portrait Gallery. From there, we'll go to the British, Mu British Library, sometimes confuse that with the museum, but let's say the British Library. Then Ajuni will take you to Caxton Hall, then we'll go back to the museum, and then Ajuni will pick up Nell Gwynne House. We'll look at some art, um, which is now in the National Museum of Scotland, and a piece at the Museum of London. And we'll end with a partition story at St. Luke's and Christ Church in Chelsea. So if that's okay, we'll start with our first location. Still got everyone attending, that's good. So we're starting here. Um, and this is the first time I've featured um, Whitehall because this is the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. It's recently had a change of name to Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, I think. Um, but look how majestic that building is. So this huge building on Whitehall at the corner with um, King Charles Street. And in the background here, you can see Buckingham Palace, right? And look at the size of this office. It kind of just reflects the history, heritage, um, but this is how we normally see it. So this is, if you're walking down Whitehall, you only see this part because this is the most kind of the view. And if you're, if you're watching TV on Remembrance Sunday, it's this balcony that the Queen and the Royal Family stand out and they come down to lay the wreaths. But it's quite an interesting building to actually go into because I've been, I haven't actually gone in myself yet, but I want to do one of these open house events, you know, in September when they open up the architecture of, of historic buildings. 
um, to visitors because I want to see this. Because this is known as the Darbar within the old India office. So within that building in the Foreign Commonwealth Office is a Darbar, which if you're from a, a Punjabi, Sikh or Indian background, you'll know it's kind of like a court. Um, and this was created um, in the India office. And this to me feels like a Victorian time capsule, but it's still a working office. Now it's been more than 70 years, right, since partition and independence, but this Darbar court still exists. And you can walk through these marbled courtyard in the heart of this building. And around it, there's all these carvings of East India Company officials, colonial generals, and all these arches have the names of great towns and provinces in India. So it has Bombay, which is now Mumbai, Madras, which is now Chennai, and you also have Kanpur, notorious in the mutiny. So to me, it's quite a historic building. Normally these offices are full of like leather bound volumes and it's all about the laws of Palestine, the laws of Aden and all these far flung outposts of empire. But the India office was kind of like the largest office. And I think going back to our first slide, when you see the aerial view, you can compare that to maybe other white hall departments to see where the power lies. You know? um, the treasury is quite local to here as well. They have a majestic building power and money go hand in hand, right? So that's our first location. Um, so I will try and do some more tours here, but it, we will probably have to access them through this open events thing in September where they open them up for one weekend. So just moving on from there, moving on close by from Whitehall, that takes you into Trafalgar Square. Now Trafalgar Square has the National Gallery. So you see that historic gallery, but in the corner of that gallery, is the National Portrait Gallery. Now this art gallery houses a collection of portraits of historically important and famous British people. And it was the first portrait gallery in the world when it opened in 1856. And when you go in here, these collections are now online as well because they have a lot of portraits, but I didn't, because it's a meeting, I didn't want to open it up. But if I was in a Punjabi school, I'd be asking them, who do you think that looks like? And they'll give me all these weird answers, you know, because anyone with a moustache in a Punjabi school is always Hitler, you know, <laughs> so but this isn't. So this is Cyril John Radcliffe. Now, when you look through the portrait gallery, <laughs> so when you look through the portrait gallery archives, what I kind of find is that the most prominent British, um, famous British people have multiple portraits. So they have a portrait when in their younger life, then in middle age, and then in their elderly life. And when you look through the archives here for the for Cyril John Radcliffe, he has about 14 portraits, you know, I think for last memory. So it's quite prominent. Um, and when you look through the galleries, you will find lots of Sikhs in there as well, because it's easy to search for them. Singh and Kaur, if you use those names, they'll bring up loads. The Singh twins are featured, Monty Panas is featured, and a load of Paralympian and Olympic game volunteers are now in the National Portrait Gallery as well. But this is an interesting one. This is Cyril John Radcliffe. And for those who talk to their parents or their grandparents will know something called the Radcliffe line. Yeah? And if we look at the Radcliffe line, you'll realize, I think, if I go, no. So he was the gentleman who went out to India as a civil servant, and he was given the chairmanship of two boundary committees. And they were set up um, and with the passing of the Indian Independence Act. And he was faced with this daunting task. He had to draw a border for the new nations of Pakistan and India in a way that would leave as many Hindus and Sikhs in India and Muslims in Pakistan as possible. Now Radcliffe submitted his partition map on the 9th of August, 1947. Can you imagine, we, we, we say 15th of August and he only submitted his map on the 9th of August. And that split Punjab and Bengal almost in half, right? Um, the new boundaries were only then announced on the 17th of August, 1947. <laughs> so they were announced three days after Pakistan's independence and two days after Indian independence. And this whole, you know, Radcliffe's effort to draw this line saw nearly 14 million people, 7 million from each side, who were displaced and they had to flee when they discovered that the new boundaries had left them in the wrong country. And even in my family, you know, 
um, my grandparents' generation, they were in Lahore, but everyone was so confident that Lahore would be in India and Gurdaspur would be in Pakistan. And it actually turned out that Gurdaspur was in India and Lahore was in Pakistan. So they had to kind of flee across the border. You know? and, and there was mayhem. You know? Millions um, were injured and several hundred thousand were killed and possibly up to two million were killed. The estimates are not reliable, but let's say two million were killed and millions more injured, right? And because of all this mayhem, Radcliffe actually refused his salary that he was paid for that piece of work when he reflected upon it. So you could in one way say, okay, his portrait's there and he gave up his salary. For me, it's a story. But also a year later, he was made a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the British Empire, you know. So, so that also. And interestingly, I see the leaks here, the leaks um, on the um, Warwick University Sikh Society, and he's attended a couple of these tours. And I just wanted to give a shout out because I didn't really realize this, but when he came back, he gave up his civil service role, so it obviously it affected him some time, and then he took retirement as the chancellor of a new university. And that university was Warwick University, I think. So, so he became the chancellor of Warwick University for about 20 years and um, retired there in the 1960s. So interesting link with partition for Warwick. And that's the kind of histories we do with these little tours. We try and connect everything up together to make it kind of relevant. So um, that's our second location, the National Portrait Gallery. And we're just gonna move on now to Euston and St. Pancras. So adjacent to King's Cross and St. Pancras Station is the British Library. Now this library is one of the greatest repositories of printed material in the world, where entire archives of British India can be found. Now the collections, they feature the founding of this East India Company that then became the British Raj, um, you find the annexation of the Punjab papers here, and you'll find papers about independence in 1947 here as well. Now, if we look at the collections, they are vast and they're kept in different places now. So the British Library has an archive in South London, in Southwark, and it is purely for the India office records and private papers. So that majestic Darbar, which had many offices full of um, India business, all of the papers warehouse in Southwark and you can access those there's village maps and plans and drawings and government papers and then in the British Library itself um, you can find things like the Dilly collection the photographs things that people want to access more kind of non-government business type stuff you know that's more tangible and to me the kind of when you look at um, records and there's 14 kilometers of shelves you know that are just full of India records, files, boxes of paper, 70,000 volume of official publications, manuscripts and printed maps, including all of those phases. East India Company, 1600s, Affairs of India up to 1858 with the mutiny in 1857, and then post-mutiny when the India office was established for the next 90 years or so. So now it's time for a journey to take over with her slides. Um, so I'm going to do slide transfers and we are going to visit Caxton Hall. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, so this is Caxton Hall, as I've said. Uh, it's located in Westminster and it's here that many events in Sikh history are recorded. So the hall was originally built using red brick and pink sandstone and was opened as Westminster Town Hall in 1883. And after the Second World War, the hall was a popular registry office for the central London area and was used by high society members and for celebrity marriages. The front was retained as its grade one listed and the remainder was converted into luxury flats in the 1980s. So there are quite a few historical events that we will cover at Caxton Hall. Firstly, it is here that in the 1900s and 1910s, the women's suffrage movement used Caxton Hall as their campaign venue. The daughter of Mahadaja Dalip Singh, Princess Sophia Dalip Singh, played a central role in this movement. Another event is in the 1920s, Babindar Singh of Patiala was recorded on the steps of Caxton Hall with Sir Michael O'Dwyer, who Rav will talk about later on today. And lastly, the more popularly known association of Caxton Hall with Sikh history events is Uddam Singh and the assassination of Sir Michael O'Dwyer. 
The earliest link of the building, Caxton Hall to Seek History, is the recorded event on the 29th of December 1908, where V. Savakad on the slide organized a celebration of the birthday of Guru Gobind Singh Ji here. And interestingly, the first recorded Jama prayers in the UK were also organized here by Deus Muhammad Ali in the same year. And moving on to Princess Safiya Dalit Singh, um, the Women's Social and Political Union was founded in Manchester in 1903 by Emmeline Pankhurst. In January 1906, it moved to London to focus on becoming a national organization. Caxton Hall was chosen as the venue for the first large meeting in the city, which took place on 19th February 1906. A year later, the, the union held its first women's parliament at Caxton Hall and suffragettes attended from all over the country as delegates of their branches. Following these meetings of the parliament, small groups of women known as deputations would march from Caxton Hall to the House of Commons where they would de deliver their resolutions. The police would always be out in force and there were always arrests of these women. Princess Sophia Dalip Singh was a prominent suffragette and her father Dalip Singh had been taken from his kingdom of Lahore and exiled to England. Sophia's mother was Bamba Miller and her godmother was Queen Victoria, which resulted in greater publicity for the movement. Here in this photograph from 18th November, 1910, we can see Sophia at the Women's Parliament in the back row, that Rav is circling now. Now I'll pass over to Rav, who will talk about another event that happened at Caxton Hall. Thank you, Ajuni. So it's quite interesting, you know, so I see a lot of people now kind of want to go and see Caxton Hall because of the legend of Uddham Singh. Um, but when I did my research a few years ago, British Pathé put this video out. You know, they've started to put their archives out on um, YouTube. And if you find the right keywords, you can actually find some interesting things. And this title doesn't say seek doesn't say Jillian Wallabagh, doesn't say Michael O'Dwyer, it just says Indians at Caxton Hall, 1920 to 1929. So, you know, your searches have to be a bit wider. And I was obviously searching Caxton Hall in about 2011. And um, I found this video. I don't want to play it now because it will just crash the system, right? Um, but you can find it on YouTube under this link or we will put it in the chat later. But this gentleman here, on the right is Maharaja Bhupinder Singh of Patiala. And this gentleman on the left, well, let's call him a gentleman, but let's say this man on the left is Sir Michael O'Dwyer. And this is quite interesting because look at the years, it's 1920s, right? And for those of you who are aware of British imperial and Sikh history will, will know of an event which took place in 1919 which was the Jallianwala Bagh of mass, um, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre in Amritsar on the 13th of April 1919. And this was a significant turning point in the Indian independence movement and in Punjab history. Yeah. So to me, when I first found this video, I just thought it was just so interesting because that is definitely Sir Michael O'Dwyer. We all know that. And we know that Bhupinder Singh was an ally of the British. And we're going to come back to the kind of the the politics of this um, later with the Juni. But to me, it was just, it's the same steps, you know, so 1920s, and then we come to the event in 1940, which is this event, right? So this is the Daily Express, but it was covered in nearly every newspaper. So Sir Michael O'Dwyer, the 13th of March, 1940, was the scene of his assassination. Now, O'Dwyer had been the Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab at the time of the Amritsar massacre, where Brigadier General Dyer, with O'Dwyer's full support, ordered soldiers to open fire on a crowd of Indian independent supporters. Now, records are mixed, but let's say one account says that over 1,500 rounds of ammunition were used in just 15 seconds. Now, the obvious result of this meant hundreds of protesters died in cold blood. The day after the massacre, the brigadier received a telegram from Governor O'Dwyer, which said, your actions were correct. The Lieutenant Governor approves. Now, over 20 years after that massacre, Singh, Uddham Singh, pulled out a revolver at a meeting and fired six shots at Caxton Hall, two of which hit the former Punjab Governor and killed him instantly. 
Now, to me, it's just these interesting quirks of history, right? Because he was there on those steps with a Sikh kind of prince 20 years earlier. 20 years later, he's on this kind of retirement circuit talking about how he wouldn't be framed from doing this kind of stuff in Kenya or in other parts of the empire if it meant that they could control, control keep their control and power. Um, and this is kind of, there's films made about this incident, Udham Singh, you know, is celebrated as a freedom fighter um, uh, in India. And this all took place um, in Westminster. And the interesting thing was, you know, the India office was there. He was there talking about his experience, but he was surrounded by other current government cabinet ministers, you know, when those shootings take, took place. I think another bullet hit another cabinet minister in the hand. It didn't kill him, but it, you know, it obviously wasn't meant for him. But Lord Zetland was also at the meeting. It was a prominent meeting, you know, um, and we focus on, on one, one person, which is Sir Michael O'Dwyer. Just while we're at Caxton Hall, it's interesting, back to the suffragettes, um, just opposite Caxton Hall is the suffragette memorial. And I remember doing a tour where some suffrage actresses from the film, The Suffragette, had come on the tour and they said that they didn't even realise there was a memorial in London, <laughs> right? And now there seems to be three that we have found. Um, so this one is just near Caxton Hall and like Ajumi said earlier, with those women's parliament and deputations taking place, it says that this um, tribute um, is to the Suffragette Fellowship to commemorate the courage and perseverance of all those men and women who in the long struggle for votes for women selflessly braved derision, opposition and ostracism, many enduring physical violence and suffering. And it says that um, this is where the parliaments were being held. We'll come back to the stamp later. But we're just going to stay on suffragette statues because also in recent times um, we can go to Parliament Square. So you come out of Caxton Hall, turn left, and it's like a 10 minute walk down to Parliament Square. And for those of us um, who watch London change over the years, it's quite interesting that Parliament Square features the great and the good. Um, Churchill obviously being a famous statue that you often see now. Um, being painted over in recent years, you know, with them um, scrawled over things and it always makes the press. But if you just walk around Parliament Square up until 2018, you could walk around, you'll probably notice that there was never a woman statue. It was always men. You'll see Nelson Mandela, you'll see Mahatma Gandhi, you'll see Churchill, you'll see some other rulers, and there was never a woman. And it was quite interesting because the original suffragette statue was moved from Parliament Square to Westminster Gardens, which is behind Big Ben. So that's a different statue and it was moved from here for some reason. So the campaign took place and on the 24th of April, 2018, the bronze statue um, featuring Dame Millicent Fawcett um, was um, unveiled. And she was the National Union of Women's Suffrage Society's um, president. And she has this banner which says, courage calls to courage everywhere which is from a speech that she gave in 1920. Now, from our perspective on our tours, on our Sikh history tours, it's quite interesting that the base of that statue has 55 women and men who supported the suffrage movement. And in this corner here by this tree in the left corner is this image of Sabai Vilipsi, which is now memorialized in Westminster Square. As for anyone who has to do kind of like, um, take the relatives on a trip around London and show them all the free places to get into, like I often used to have to do. This is quite a nice one to pass. We show them Big Ben and you can take them here and say, look, Sophia the Leap Singh is also here. We're going to stay on the theme of Sophia because I'm just going to take you across to Camden now, Camden near Holborn. Um, and this is the British Museum. Its collections are dedicated to human history and culture which was a learning point for me and maybe some others because it's always difficult to find anything British in the British Museum, which is now why you realize it's not about Britishness, it's about human history and culture, which was quite interesting. Um, it has 8 million works and it's amongst the largest and most comprehensive in existence, originating with items from all continents. Established in 1753, um, based on the collections of a physician scientist called Sir Hans Sloan, and it opened to the public in 1759 at its current site um, in Bloomsbury. It's expanded over the years, um, but it expanded largely as a result of the, 
the growing British colonial footprint. And this resulted in um, creating several branch museums. So actually the Natural History Museum in South Kensington, which we all take the children to see the dinosaurs, was an extension of the British Museum as it started to collect items from around the world. Interesting. So for us, the interesting thing was that when I ran these tours in my early years, I used to miss out the British Museum because simply it only had one coin on display, which was one of these that had anything relevant to do with Sikhi or Sikh history. So for me to drag people all the way to Holborn to see one coin, which I've got five of them behind in my cabinet, was kind of like not worth it. But in recent years, um, it's had a revamp. It now has a whole new India section, um, which is this section here, multiple galleries on the Indian subcontinent. And they've actually given Sikhi or Sikhism um, three of its own cabinets. And in there is the Dastar Bunga, which is a fortress turban, a turban from an Agali, which is the warrior sect of Sikhs. And this is from the early 1910s. It used to be kept around Whitehall. Um, then it was re, re, I won't say refurbished, but reconstituted in its original form. Um, and it was on display in 2012. And now they've put it on permanent display. We have some of the weapons from Sikh um, armies, probably from Lahore is where that shield is. They've now put eight coins on display. Um, textiles and architectural plans by Ilam Singh in the corner there. And if you go opposite to this cabinet, you see this. And we're still on the theme of Princess Sophia because this is the gold embroidered sari of Princess Sophia Philip Singh. So this would have come from Lahore probably as well, and she may have inherited it from her father or grandmother. But this is a sari which is very, very heavy because the thread is gold thread, right? So it, to me, um, I think the British Museum do a disservice to it by laying it like this. If they laid it out as worn, then it'd be mighty impressive, but I think it's fragile and delicate. <laughs> so I think it's on loan from the Peter Vance collection. So um, it's interesting to see where he acquired it from, but that's probably a lot of gold in that sari as well. So um, going back to the Juni, we're gonna move on to some more princesses. Yes, um, thank you, Rab. So India under the British Raj consisted of two types of territory. There was British India and the princely states, as you can see on the map. Um, the princely states were semi-sovereign principalities that were governed by local rulers who were termed prince and princess by the British. This was to avoid the implications that native rulers could be termed kings or queens with equal status to that of the British monarch. So in Punjab, the princely states included places like Nabba, Patiala and Kapurthala, as you can see on the map. Thank you, Rav. So the next story brings Kapoor Sala's connection to the streets of London and introduces us to Maharaj Kumari Indra Devi, who was the oldest of the three Kapoor Sala princesses. She enrolled at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, known as Radha, located next to University College London. She was one of the most glamorous women of her time and featured in Vogue magazine in 1938. Um, this is where Indra lived while in London, and along this road, um, Sloan Avenue in Chelsea, is where many artists and actors lived. This road is still, decades later, full of luxury apartments, as it's in central London. So, Indra was known for being an actress, fashion icon, London socialite, and became a radio broadcaster following the outbreak of World War II and the London film industry closing during the war. During World War II, she regularly gave BBC radio broadcasts in Hindi for the Indian soldiers recovering in England, and she drove ambulances for the French Red Cross. She broke social barriers for what was considered appropriate for women, especially brown women, making her a feminist icon. And she was also the first female reporter to be permitted into the press gallery to present a weekly report on Parliament affairs. So from one female pioneer in the past to um, current female pioneers now. We have the Singh Twins. They are contemporary British artists with an international reputation. They're known for their highly detailed and symbolic 
style of art rooted in Indian aesthetics. The Singh Twins' work are in private and public collections worldwide. One of their most well-known pieces is shown in the presentation. It's a symbolic portrait of Mahadaja Dalip Singh, created for the National Museum of Scotland. Another well-known piece of art is called Entwined and was commissioned by the Museum of London in 2008. Entwined combines traditional Indian painting techniques and Western influences to create a storytelling piece of work. So here we can see the title at the top says the Illustrated London News with reports of the Lahore Treaty, which maintained peace in the Punjab prior to the Sikh Wars. And there's also the Grey Box, um, with a statement by George Bush in 2001 relating to the war on terror. The words in the orange frame around the edge are Hindi words that are now part of the English dictionary, such as pajama and khaki. Moving into the um, artworks now in the blue frame in the top right, we can see figures like Uddam Singh in white, Gandhi just below him, and Bhagat Singh, who fought for the Indian independence movement also. Moving across to the middle, we can see Sophia the Leap Singh illustrated in black and white, um, representing her presence in the suffragette movement. Um, the Singh Twins work Entwined has just vast amounts of history behind it, and we can talk about it all day, but there's more points to cover in this presentation. So, yeah, moving on to another piece of Sikh history is St. Luke's Church, which is the tallest parish church in London. It's often referred to as Chelsea's Cathedral. In 1819, there was a competition for the design of St. Luke's Church, where plans for different styles were submitted by architects of the time. James Savage's plans were based on 16th century medieval Gothic styles, also seen today in university cities like Oxford and Cambridge. Savage's designs were accepted, and St. Luke's became one of the first Gothic revival churches to be built in London. And it is at St. Luke's Church that a remarkable monument stands in memory of the Punjab Frontier Force. This chapel commemorates one of the great fighting unit, units of the Indian Army, with a repository of the memories and traditions of the force, who carved out an epic reputation of the northwest frontier of Punjab during the Second Afghan War in 1878. Having faced the Sikh armies on the battlefield, in 1848 to 1849, the British recognized Sikh soldiers as formidable warriors and began to raise military units in the province. Ravel now provides some more details on the chapel. Thank you, Ajimni. So with partition in 1947 and the departure of the British um, to create um, the modern day India, Pakistan, and at that time, West Pakistan, and now Bangladesh, um, there was some anxiety about the preservation of these memorials that had been set up in the garrison churches of the Punjab region. Now, um, many people in India um, on, on that, in that Punjab area reached out to places in London and they were getting kind of disappointing responses from museums and galleries and military places because everyone was so busy with the exit of the British from India. But it was this St. Luke's Church which agreed to um, receive the memorabilia from India. And what they did was they created a sanctum in the crypt of the church and a chapel was actually designed um, in a section of the main church. Um, so what we see is all of the regiments that made up the frontier force are commemorated in this chapel. Um, the badges of 14 units are now carved on glass screens. The wooden walls have records on them and the chapel chairs and the furniture is all from that Punjab region. Um, the altar mantle here, the frontal here and the altar is also in the colours of red, gold and green, which are the colours of the Punjab frontier force, which you can see their logo here. Now what happened when you get into this story is um, we, we take our tours here um, and it was relatively unknown in 2010 when I stumbled across it by looking for some accounts, to be honest. I was searching the Punjab, came across some accounts, and the accounts were actually to close the association. And what they did was um, make these glass screens and then they closed the association. And for me, when I walked in, spoke to people, the Gurkhas still have their crypt downstairs. So Gurkha regiments would come to the church to pay their respects or learn about their regiments. 
but the Sikh regiments or the Punjab regiments um, had kind of faded away. Um, and when I walked in, they actually thought I was a Gurkha because only Gurkhas ever used to visit. But it really does feel like we're stepping back into time. This carpet here was donated in the 1950s by Her Majesty the Queen. All of these um, items on the walls that I was showing earlier, these are actually from Punjab. This flag is the second Punjab regiment flag. Um, above is the Union Jack from Kotak. Um, all the regiment badges are here. And the bit I like about this chapel, it's actually the working chapel. So every day at 9 a.m. there's prayers for world peace that are held here in this chapel by the church. So regardless of the fact that um, very few of our community know it, it, it exists, you know, we're trying to promote it with our tours. Um, what they did, we're at near the end of our presentation now, but what they did was they produced this leaflet. And when you come into this church, they have this leaflet um, on the right hand side, and it says, do not remove from the chapel, but I think um, I did remove it. We got it scanned and we kept a digital copy of it now. But what it says in the leaflet is, um, this leaflet has described how this memorial chapel came into being and its gradual enhancement over the years by members of the Punjab Frontier Force Association. Um, and what it says is now that the association is slowly passing into history, the hope is that the dedication, courage, loyalty and affection, which is apparent here, will pass on to future generations, both here and in Pakistan and India. So I hope that's kind of a nice way to end the first of our tours to just reflect on the fact that um, since 1951, there's a chapel um, in Chelsea, which reflects a story of partition. And, it, and although those people who set the chapel up have now passed on, their hope is that the dedication, courage, loyalty and affection, which is apparent, uh, will pass on to future generations, both here and in Pakistan and India. So on that note, Emily, I will end the first tour.